Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, I uh, wanted to introduce our speakers. So, Dr. Moise Saran uh, completed medical school and internal medicine residency at the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Mexico City. He then came here to Cleveland, where he completed a residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at Metro Health Medical Center. And he currently is a MedPeds hospitalist at the Cleveland Clinic, as well as an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. Um, he has been recognized for excellence in teaching and has been listed as one of the best doctors in America by U.S. News and World Report. Um, and he remains very active on multiple national committees, most notably the American College of Physicians, serving as chair of the Council of Early Career Physicians. He is known nationally for work in quality and patient safety, working on projects such as the Impact Perioperative Task Force, and creating and implementing a risk stratification tool for venous thromboembolism risk assessment in pediatric patients at Cleveland Clinic Children's. His work in perioperative blood management was recognized by the Society of Hospital Medicine, winning the 2011 award for excellence in teamwork and quality improvement. He is known by his colleagues for his boundless energy and enthusiasm, uh, and his commitment to excellence in patient care and quality improvement. Uh, personally, he has been a friend and mentor to me for the past several years, as he has been to many residents and medical students over the past decade. Please welcome Dr. Moise Saron. Well, after this really unexpected and very beautiful introduction, I'm going to cancel my sertraline prescription. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I want to really express my uh, most sincere gratitude for your hospitality and opportunity to be here with you. I have a true privilege to be sharing with you our colleagues from UH and Case Medical School. We are all uh, under the same umbrella, and I hope that this lecture will be amusing and stimulate some talks about the way we practice and hopefully changing even further the practice of medicine. I don't have any relationship to disclose regarding the, this presentation. Um, first of all, I want to make you think about what is the safest transition? It is the one that we avoid, or is the best transition the one that we avoid? What is the evidence? What is the comparison? We have been changing the way we practice medicine, and especially the way we practice blood management in the past uh, several years. A little bit of physiology, and this is for the residents, it's really good to always remember this equation. They seem a little bit boring and a little bit uh, overwhelming, but they are not. They are very simple. Always remember our, the component of the stroke volume, your preload, your afterload, and your contractility. Why? Because these are things that you can actually aim to modify. I mean, you can always improve your preload, you give some fluid, and then your patient may be anemic, but you may improve your oxygen delivery by enhancing uh, your preload. Your cardiac output will be determined by your stroke volume times your heart rate. Your arterial content of oxygen, of course, hemoglobin will be a component of it, and it's actually 1.34 grams of hemoglobin per gram of, uh, grams of oxygen per uh, gram of hemoglobin. But you can modify your saturation, and uh, you can also, mo uh, which is basically something that you can enhance with uh, uh, giving more oxygen to the patient. Your oxygen delivery will be, of course, your um, cardiac output times your arterial content of oxygen. So you enhance your stroke volume that may enhance your cardiac output, you avoid um, inotropic negative or chronotropic negative medication. That's why in sepsis we avoid using beta blockers so that we can actually enhance the cardiac output of the patient and we do not need to uh, use the blood for enhancing oxygen delivery. Basically what happens is when we have anemia, there's an increase in the cardiac output, there's redistribution at the microcirculation with capillary recruitment, and there's a right shift of the hemoglobin to try to release more oxygen to the tissues. So the first, uh, tra first, animal to, first transition was actually an animal to human that was actually documented in 1667, and basically they used it from, uh, from monkeys and tried to use psychiatric diseases. What do you think the outcome was? Not good, right? Um, the first human-to-human -human transition was up until the 19th century by Jane Blondell, and basically it was a husband to wife. And also they started doing a 10 patients and, and a 50% mortality rate. So it was a little bit mystified, and then subsequently over the next uh, century we started getting uh, Landsteiner, discovered ABO, and so forth, and now where we are now. When we talk about anemia tolerance, every, each of us has a different anemia tolerance. But what is 
the ideal hemoglobin level. We need to understand the impact of anemia on the cardiovascular system. In patients with coronary artery disease, we see a lot, high prevalence of this in the state. Valvular disease, elderly patients. What are the effects on the CNS, the effects on cognition, the effect at the level of the splachnic and renal perfusion? So the first data that we started seeing that patients could have an impact from anemia was seen, for instance, in Jehovah Witnesses. More than 18 years old, 1958 patient in the decade of late 1980s, early 1990s. And they found up to 2,000 patients that the patient who did not have cardiovascular disease, they actually had a pretty good uh, outcome. However, they reached hemoglobin even down to six with a modest uh, increase in the risk of mortality. However, the patient who had active cardiovascular disease, they did have a substantial increase up to 33% in mortality. So this, this was uh, something, okay, so there's a difference between a patient with a diseased endothelium and a patient with a healthy endothelium. Like everything really reduces to the endothelium nowadays. Now in coronary artery bypass grafting, the same thing. Out of uh, 5,000 5, patients, 4,800 were not transfused, and they found that the patients who were anemic, hemoglobin below 11 actually increases all the composite adverse effects. And basically, patients who had the error score, which is an ICU score of more than four, kind of like it would be an Apache of more than eight. So they say, okay, so patients who had an hemoglobin of 11, and they're really sick with systemic disease, they don't have a great tolerance to anemia this time. So in this Medicare population, basically comparing patients with anemia alone, patients with chronic kidney disease, patients with anemia and heart failure, and patients with both heart failure and chronic kidney disease and anemia. And it was seen that the component of anemia adding anemia to, the, to, to this, you could see that each individual, a patient with chronic kidney disease alone, versus anemia, there's an increase in your risk of mortality. Patients with heart failure alone versus heart failure and anemia increase your risk of mortality. The patient with both of them have higher risk, but anemia by itself increases substantially also your poor outcome. So, so far we are seeing that anemia is not as benign as we could have been. Now, this is the more recent, it just published online this month in the American Journal of Medicine saying that the patient who, who has a stable coronary artery disease is a prospective cohort, is multinational, 45 countries, sees up to 32,000 patients. And they found that the patients who have anemia before, uh, before hospitalization, they have an increased risk of all-cause mortality, which is significant for a stable and unstable angina. And when the baseline anemia after the patient uh, is admitted and treated and they optimize the anemia, they are able to normalize, it decreases the mortality down to a non-significant um, rate. But however, there's more increase in major bleeding. There's always some outcome that they see. But nonetheless, this adds up that the anemia has also an impact in patients for outcome. So this is a study on young people, 293 patients. This was in the decade of 1980s and early 1990s, that people that refused to get any kind of transfusion, and they were monitoring this patient, and they, people who were actually healthy, and down to hemoglobin of seven, the mortality was really not significantly different to patients with a higher degree of hemoglobin. However, when the hemoglobin dropped down, especially below five, there's a substantial decrease in your uh, probability of survival. And then to, con to conclude this part, this is a study of pre-op anemia and post-op outcome. One of the things I've been focusing really is in the perioperative anemia. So this is in non-cardiac surgery. These are up to 227,000 patients. Out of these, 70,000 have pre-op anemia. The patients with anemia, they have a substantial increase in your perioperative mortality and morbidity, even for mild anemia. So far, what I have told you is, Pre-op anemia and anemia by itself has increased post-op morbidity and mortality. Anemia in patients with coronary artery disease has increased risk of mortality as well. So, what should be the core of hemoglobin to transfuse? When should we treat this patient? When should we use blood? Is 10 to 30? Well, that's what I learned. 
and it was based in experience. And actually, from a study from 1942 by Adams and Lonely, who were uh, OBGYN surgeons, and they used a cohort of healthy patients, and they decided that 1030 was the ideal hemoglobin value. And this translated for decades, going uh, basically this um, yielded in an indiscriminate use of blood up to 15 million of packed red blood per year. And if you know, and I will show you the cost of each unit, when you multiply by that, you see that the cost is outstandingly outrageous. And in all the world, up to 85 million packed red blood per year. Until 1988, uh, the NIH consensus statement on pre-op red blood cell transfusion say, wait a second, 1030, why? What's the rationale? We are over transfusing. We are spending way too much when we started like looking into cause, the benefit of things. And the NIH said, we need to start investigation and research to really realize what should be the core of hemoglobin. After this is when most of the studies that I'm going to be showing you started to happen and yielded in the current behavior and practice that we have. So the first study, well, they have to be in healthy patients and they use hemodilution, acute normal volumic hemodilution. So I take 500 ml out of your blood, I inject you 500 ml of normal saline, and I keep doing aliquots in and out until I reach an hemoglobin level that I actually want. So in these patients that are coronary artery disease who are stable, are taking chronic beta blocker therapy, they were able that this patient actually had a, a, an appropriate increase in cardiac index in the oxygen extraction, and there were no significant changes in S2 when they were moving from almost 13 down to 10 grams per deciliter. Now, when you do the transesophageal echocardiogram, they are able to see that mean while you actually preserve the central venous pressure, you are going to preserve the stroke volume, kind of going back to the physiology equation. So these patients were clinically stable, and they were able to tolerate down to 9.3. So they, they, they were getting a little bit more aggressive in each subsequent story. Now, elderly patients, healthy elderly patients. So we are focusing on the most frail of our patient population. Patient with cardiovascular disease, elderly patients. So this is 20 patients with an average age of 76 years old. And of course, they excluded any significant cardiovascular comorbidities. And they were able to, to see that hemodilution down to 8.8 .8 has significant increase in your cardiac index, which was appropriate increasing oxygen extraction with what's appropriate, decreasing systemic venous resistance in an appropriate way with no significant changes in your EKG. So in this study of a young patients, just like any of the residents here, they compared 23 patients with hemoglobin of 12.5 to 13.4, acute normal volumic hemodilution down to 4.5 to 5.4, and the uh, oxygen consumption was not changed and the lactate was not increased. So this was tolerated appropriately in healthy young patients. But now, what is what happened in the brain? Well, when you do the horizontal addition, immediate memory, numeric substitution, or remote memory, you can see when the patient has an hemoglobin of 7.2, the speed of reaction is very similar when the hemoglobin is 12 or above. However, when you decrease the hemoglobin to six, you start seeing a change in your speed of reaction. And when that hemoglobin reaches an 80 or 5.1, then you have a, sig a significant delay, not even a maybe microsecond, but it shows you that this patient with hemoglobin of seven, they have a, a delay in the speed of reaction. However, the beauty of the study is that they transfuse them to bring them back to 7.2. And then even the speed of reaction is even less than before. So they, they, they actually they, they have a faster speed of reaction when they go back to normal. So based on this study, we started saying, okay, maybe the cutoff of seven should be the appropriate one to minimize the risk of brain injury and effect on the patient's uh, uh, cogent status. You could see that the immediate or delayed memory between hemoglobin of seven and 14, there was actually no difference. Now the next part is pretty amusing. So they did exactly the same thing, and they said, okay, let's keep the patient on 5.7 with room air. Let's give the patient some oxygen. So they, the, they give the patient nasal cannula of oxygen, five liters per minute, 
Six liters per minute, some sort of high flow to three really increase the PAO2 of more than 300. And they found that the speed of reaction of the anemic patient of 5.7 that received oxygen was similar to the patient with a normal hemoglobin value. So again, you have the acute patient that is anemic, you optimize the volume, you preload them, you put some oxygen on board, you can hold the transfusion while you are able to fix other things, at least in the acute setting. I mean, if you need to transfuse, you transfuse. But let's, let's not just transfuse right away, just focusing on a number. I mean, we see sickle cell patients that are walking down there with hemoglobin of five. And um, we have had first cases that we somebody transfuse them because transfuse the number, and then the patient is in, lies in the ICU with a hyperhemolytic reaction. And guess who's the QIO, and guess who reviewed those cases? So, so far I have demonstrated you. Anemia before surgery has bad outcome. Anemia in cardiovascular patient is associated with bad uh, outcomes, also more mortality. With hemodilution studies in relatively healthy subjects or even healthy subjects that have stable coronary artery disease, it demonstrates that hemoglobin can be tolerated down to seven to eight. What happened with real life patients? Can we translate? Are we comparing apples with oranges? So this is a fundamental study to be known. There's a trick study in the intensive care unit. And they basically compare all kinds of patients from all medical and surgical diseases. And they had two strategies, patients with hemoglobin of less than nine, and that they were actually euvolemia. Euvolemia is the most in this patient. They need to be, t they need to be kept well preloaded. And the strategies were a restrictive strategy, which means when the patient reaches an hemoglobin of seven, no matter what, I will transfuse. A liberal is when the hemoglobin is less than 10, I will transfuse. When they compared both of them, they found that the patient who had a restrictive transition strategy has actually less mortality than the patient with liberal strategy. But here's even more fascinating. When you see the patient with a patch score of less than 20, meaning they're super sick patient but are not that sick as a super sick. So more than 20 is super, super sick, less than 20 is super sick, right? Uh, so you can see that this patient, there's a double in the risk of, of, of mortality just by just using liberal transition strategy, you start thinking, oh my goodness, what is, what is that we doing? Even more fascinating, young patient, less than 55 year old, the same thing. You double the risk of mortality among the patients where you're actually utilizing blood compared with the patient in whom you decide to pursue a restrictive approach to transfusion. Now, what happened? The real patient, high risk patient, multiple stands, in and out of the hospital, they're coming to hip surgery. They're all more than 50 years old, and they compare, this is a focus study. L less than 10, and so 10 is the color for liberal strategy, and eight the color for restrictive strategy. There was no significant change in outcome, either in MI, in infection, in venous thromboembolism, in death, or the composite uh, death, myocardial infarction pneumonia, VT or stroke, free operation or ICU admission. So even in high risk patients, a cutoff of eight was proven safe compared with a liberal strategy. Now, this is the study of all those big trials that we heard about in the 1990s that now is changing the way we practice, right? Remember Gusto, Pursuit, Paragon. Now we don't hear that much about it with the status quo. But 24,000 patients that they got at least one unit of blood. And there's another study we'll show you later on, of at least one unit of blood, with a crit of more than five. The patient who did not get any transfusion, compared with the patient who get a transfusion, their, the cumulative mortality is way higher in the patient who were at least transfused one unit overall. Now, we don't know what was the baseline core of hemoglobin, but we are seeing in these big population studies that there's adverse outcome linked to the transition. I mean, of course, we could always argue that these patients have other comorbidities, but, uh, but it's still important to, uh, to think about it. Now, more recently, we have found adverse effects in the patient who get a blood transfusion, restrictive versus liberal. What is the rate of getting a serious infection? And actually, it actually increases the patient with liberal strategies. They have 17% risk of acquiring a serious infection in the hostel 
compared with just 12% in the patients who get a restrictive approach. So it's not just mortality, also the risk of infection, and of course, antibiotic use, and of course, CDF, and of course, length of stay, and so forth. Most recently, the sepsis guidelines have been changing. Why? Because in the patient with septic shock, when you pursue a low hemoglobin threshold versus a higher hemoglobin threshold, there's not a significant change in the patient mortality. Therefore, why would you pursue a liberal threshold for this patient? It's rather uh, be restrictive and conservative. Most of the trials have been really showing that, in general, a restrictive behavior has a tendency here in barely, not, not statistically significant, but barely 1.02. Nonetheless, it's a tendency toward uh, decreasing your mortality risk when you pursue a restrictive approach. So clinical outcome of using blood often in cardiovascular surgery, reoperation, increased mortality and morbidity, sepsis, pulmonary complication, patient with cancer. It can, could be an independent, potentially independent predictor of recurrence, increased risk of lymphoplasmacytic and marginal tone lymphoma. In patients with surgical patients that are non-cardiac, increased risk of VT, acute kidney injury, reoperation, and so forth. Now, this is a non-cardiac surgery in patients with cardiovascular diseases. This is a most recent trial was just published um, uh, a couple months ago, and they found that actually the patient who gets a restrictive transfusion, they, ha they have actually a, uh, a decreased risk of pulmonary edema. However, there's an increase in the risk of MI and acute coronary syndrome. So, basically in this group of patients, when the hemoglobin is above eight, it actually decreases the risk of adverse cardiovascular outcome. So this is what is now changing our practice and being more mindful that in patients with active core cardiovascular disease, we rather have a more general restrictive level of eight. We don't do seven, we do eight. Seven for the non-cardiovascular disease patient, eight for the people with cardiac disease patients. What are the, the, the guidelines, actually we can actually, this is where the guidelines published in 2012, that basically say consider. You need to read these like a lawyer reads a paper. It says, in critical care patient, consider transfusion in hemoglobin. It doesn't say transfuse, consider. In post surgical patient, you consider if the hemoglobin is, is higher or also in the cardiovascular disease patient. A uh, couple four months ago, there was an update of the guidelines. They reinforced the same thing. Now a little bit more solid. Seven for the average non-cardiovascular disease patient, eight for the people with cardiac disease. Patient with cardiac disease, you cut up eight for transfusion, consider, consider transfusion. <clears throat> and um, non-cardiac disease is seven grams per deciliter. Now, all of this is beautiful. But if the patient is bleeding, what should I do? Well, if the patient is actively bleeding, well, you need to, of course, optimize hemoglobin status, put two large bore IV lines, and read the study by Villanueva in Barcelona. They published this very nice study, 921 patients with active upper GI bleeding. And they have a mix of cirrhotic patients, mix of non-cirrhotic patients. And they compare a restrictive approach, waiting until the hemoglobin reaches less than seven to give patient blood versus a higher level. And they found that six week survival was actually higher, 95% in the restrictive approach versus 91% in the liberal approach. The risk of rebleeding was 10% in the restrictive approach versus 16% in the liberal approach. So more survival, less rebleeding. I could argue that perhaps the patient with cirrhosis and esophageal viruses, you give them blood, you may engorge those viruses and keep bleeding more. That could be rational, but nonetheless, the restrictive have less bleeding. And also, in the patient with peptic ulcer, peptic ulcer disease, there was no significant change in either restrictive versus liberal. So, including this study in another four article, basically patients who have active GI bleeding, the composite of evidence actually favors uh, a restrictive approach. Now, in the Cleveland clinic, our endoscopies do not pursue an EGD if the hemoglobin is not more than eight. And it's a very frustrating situation because they, the patient could be actively bleeding and they don't do anything until hemoglobin is optimized of more than eight. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll change that practice 
over the next uh, few months or years. So I have shown you an image bath, patient can tolerate cut off of up to seven for normal patient, eight for cardiovascular disease patient, that if you are bleeding, you can still have a restrictive approach. Nonetheless, you say, that's beautiful, I want to transfuse. Fair enough. How much is enough? So in critically ill patients, a study of 35,000 uh, patients in Europe ICU, and they found that when the patient has a transfusion, there's an increase in mortality, but when the patient reaches a threshold of four or more units, is when the mortality risk gets significant. So when you're seeing a patient coming from your unit to your floor, patient already got one unit or two units, be mindful, patient already got two units, let's hold, let's wait, because the more we add can potentially increase the risk of mortality. The same thing, this is the database of the American College of Surgeons. They found that in patients have an increased risk of infection when you use more than four units or you operate or you use blood in the OR, you have an increased mortality risk and you have an increased length of stay. And length of stay nowadays is, is very sensitive for operational management. Now, this is uh, the, the past year, uh, well, um, 2015, the end of 2015, Dr. Auerbach from uh, UCSF. So they found that a pa any patient, and this was a whole data set, national data set of almost uh, 1,500,000 patients, and they compared the patients who were transfused versus not transfused. Even a single unit of blood transfusion, when you compare, it increased your risk in a significant way, your risk of mortality. Even just giving one unit in the whole population. Now, you could argue, well, maybe I'm giving a unit because a very sick patient that was going to die anyway. Well, it's kind of hard. I mean, you always need to interpret data very carefully and always also use your clinical gestalt at the bedside. Not everything is at the number. But be mindful that um, there's a correlation. I mean, they are using database retrospective uh, with a uh, system, uh, uh, multivirus uh, trial. But relevant to me it is, is also to consider how can I optimize this patient rather than giving the blood. So we transfuse, we're going to get a consent, what are the risk? Well, first of all, this study, and this was actually demystified later on, it was in cardiac surgery patient, and they, they, they look at the patient who has the use of all blood, like more than two weeks, they have an increased risk of mortality, mortality at one year, intubation, renal failure, and sepsis. And this is because the erythrocyte suffer a conformational change as the blood starts getting older. So there's a, so basically 75% of red blood cells after they get the phlebotomy is down, 75% remain viable. That has a consequent decrease in ATP and 2,3 phosphoglycerate, decrease in membrane phospholipids, and basically you have structural changes that can actually uh, cause hemolysis and poor tissue delivery. Nonetheless, most recently, uh, 2015, there was this nice study in critical care, critically adults, and they found that all blood versus uh, fresh uh, versus fresh cells, there's no changes in 90 days mortality in critically ill adults. So we started like challenging the practices that we were doing based on the Cleveland Clinic story. Then this is the AABB guideline published in October. They say that there's no change between using all blood versus fresh blood in terms of patient outcome. And even more recently, just a few months ago, they found that comparing the patient with 13 days uh, short-term storage blood versus 23.6 days, there's no change in your mortality. Both of them have around 9% mortality. So we are now challenging the practice. In the clinic, we still use fresh blood. It's younger than two weeks old. But if you have blood that is two weeks or older, you can use it safely. And even, even it just published online last month. Uh, it's a study of 8,000 patients in, in, uh, in uh, Sweden and Denmark. So the 30 days cumulative mortality in the patients who had blood uh, stored for 30 to 40 days versus 10 to 19 days is not significant uh, different. And the patient who had 
more than six units of blood stored for 30 days of, of, uh, or longer, there's, bless you, there's no significant uh, change in mortality. So, so we have very, very compelling data so far that the use of all blood does not necessarily affect. Now, what are the implications of this? This has very significant implications because some patients say, doctor, I don't want to use anybody else's blood. I want to use my own blood. Give me po. I want an auto self uh, auto transfusion. Well, Medicare does not cover auto transfusion. It doesn't cover EPO for people that do not have a hip surgery or a Jehovah Witness patient. So the problem is that who pays for the EPO? And also in the clinic, we do not use auto transfusion. There's no protocol for auto transfusion. We do not store blood. So that has implication in the way patient satisfaction, in the way patient want to be treated. Also, when you always say, well, I'm going to transfuse you, there's a risk of HIV, hepatitis, how often do you guys say that? We always say that, right? Well, the risk of HIV and hepatitis is the same, the same risk as crashing in an airplane. It's the same risk as getting a lightning falling of you. It's really very, very low. What we should worry about is the transfusion associated overload, TACO, or a non hemolytic uh, immune reaction that has that cause um, indolent fever. That's more common. Even it's more common to commit a, a medical error and patient die from that. It's even more common crashing than getting HIV or hepatitis. So be mindful when you use blood, give one unit at a time. We want units to wait as the patient optimize them. Be mindful of the of the oxygenation of the volume status. Target eubolemia, no hypervolemia to avoid circulatory overload. In addition to that, there's some idea that maybe the xenotropic murine respiratory virus, which is kind of a rare thing, but this is, this is more for Dr. Armitage here. Uh, there's some virus for you. Uh, uh, it, 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 it could potentially be linked to chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, I was transfused, I got this. There's really no compelling uh, uh, data about that. Now, this is from the United uh, Kingdom. So the serious hazard of transfusion, this is the, the, the shot that they have these, uh, these statistics, and they say, what is what we could not really prevent? An acute transfusion reaction. This is probably not preventable. I mean, patients have some mild antigen, we couldn't detect them, and they get that. Yeah, and, but what could we potentially prevent? Well, alloimmunization, uh, TACO, Trally, hemolytic transition reaction, but way less than acute transition reaction. Now, adverse events caused by error. This is what we need to really focus as a human being. Avoidable or under transfusion. So, not giving blood to people who really need, that's also a mistake. Using anti D immunoglobulin, handing and this blood banking, or incorrect blood component transfusion. So, also being mindful, these are the things we can uh, 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 chain. Now, how much a cost of leukoreduced reduced unit costs? $1,000. It varies from 700 to $1,000. I invite you to go to the blood bank here and, hey, how much a pack red blood cell cost? Ask that question. 15 million, we're using 15 million per year in the U.S.? Multiply by that. <laughs> it's, it's just an insane, sacrilegious number of dollars spent in unnecessary blood. And when we use the Premier database, which the Premier database is the same that was used by, by Dr. Auerbach, so when you see all the opportunities for saving either blood, plasma, platelet, cryo, or whole blood, you could save up to $165 million just from avoiding unnecessary transition. So I have told you, anemia is bad, we can tolerate anemia, we can, we need to be mindful of the adverse effect of transition. Transition is costly. So what are we going to do? Well, we need to optimize the anemia. We need to figure out why the patient is anemic. Are they bleeding? Are they not making enough blood? So fi find out hematinic deficiencies, the patient having hemolysis, and optimize anemia. Try to fix that. Try to improve those things. So you have, so non-transitional effort should be pursued. So how can we do that? Well, some of the protocols that we can use, and these are the protocols that we have for pre-op anemia optimization in the Cleveland Clinic. 
This is the only thing I found that was about protocol. I found this Goldie Hound movie of protocol. So I put that, the word protocol. Um, but anyhow, then we, we look at iron, uh, iron uh, absorption. I want to understand the dietary factor that will impact iron absorption. First of all, from all what we eat, it gets absorbed into iron up to like two milligrams per day. And normally what we should be sharing uh, skin cell shedding and mucosal cell shedding and overturn turnover, we shed out two milligrams per day. So in that school, we should be okay. But when we are losing more patients with active bleeding, patients with heavy menses and poor diet, you start losing uh, your reservoir. And your, most of your reserve is actually in the, in, the, in the blood. Most of the iron is in the blood. But you have also in the liver, in your, in your spleen, your macrophages, and your bone marrow. You need to understand the role of your ferroportin for, for, for absorbing iron. Remember, the ferroportin is going to be affected by the level of hepcidin that gets increased in the patient with, an, uh, an, with any kind of chronic inflammation. Also, will be affected by the patient with zinc deficiency. The patient with zinc deficiency will not, that, that's the cofactor for the ferroportin to allow iron to cross. The patient with Wilson disease, copper displays the zinc and ferroportin doesn't work. Or the opposite, when you have copper deficiency, remember metalloproteinases plays a very big role for regulating ferroportin. So, but when we replace iron, oral iron, this is a very interesting story. This is in iron depleted young ladies, and they compare with a ferritin of less than 20 milligrams. And they compare when you give iron one a day, twice a day, three times a day. And they found that the patient, when you give like a six-fold in the iron dose, it causes only a three-fold increase in the iron absorbed. However, when, and, and also, there was an increase in the systemic expression of the hepcidin. So the problem is, I was giving my patient I ferrosulfate three times a day, and they were not getting better. But some patients were giving once a day, and they were getting better. But this study came up, and they, oh my goodness, now it makes sense. Probably there's more hepcidin produced as a, as a response to the higher doses of oral iron. Do you rather give one or do you two times a day rather than three times a day? It may actually get more by available iron absorbed. So why is iron so poorly absorbed? I mean, number one, this is the model of the patient with end stage renal disease, okay? But it applies very well to a lot of pa other patients. Poor dietary source, anorexia, low protein diet, poor GI absorption. Everybody is on antacid. Every single patient is on antacid. Take those antacids away. You don't need antacid. I mean, change the diet, lose weight, elevate your, the head of the bed. Don't drink too much fluid with your meal. Give some time for the food to get out. There's increase in hepcidin. A lot of people have, like we say, everything reduces to the endothelium, right? Bad endothelium, cardiovascular disease, chronic inflammation, osteomyelitis, bad diabetes. The anterior renal disease uses phosphate binders, calcium. That displaces iron. There's also acloridria from antacids, acloridria from pernicious anemia, acloridria from bad diabetes, acloridria from uh, anterior renal disease and uremic arthropathy, atrophic arthritis by itself, bacterial overgrowth. We have a lot of patients now with uh, gastric bypasses and uh, new changes that have a lot of bacterial overgrowth, ACE pylori infection, active use of antiplatelet. Everybody's on an aspirin. And it can cause mild GI bleeding. Frequent phlebotomies. Minimize the phlebotomy. That also causes a lot of iron loss. And the patient with anti renal disease, well, patient with uh, renal disease, they have proteinuria, and of course you have less transferrin, increase, increase of iron utilization with erythro, uh, erythropoietin, TLF disease. So if you see, a lot of our patients can have many of these factors uh, end up in per iron. So, how low is enough? So what we use is the ferritin and transferrin saturation. If your ferritin is less than 100, you have iron deficiency, no matter what the IBC is. And the saturation less than 20% means iron deficiency. Now, you can have a ferritin um, up to like 150, 200, but the saturation of less than 20%, you may have a combination of anemia of chronic disease and iron deficiency. So. How do we know how much iron deficit a patient has? Well, there's the Gansoni formula, which we don't really use anymore. We just say, on average, somebody who has an hemoglobin of less than 12, like 10 to 11, you at least, at least have a gram of deficit, a gram of iron deficit. 
more likely will be two grams or, or more. But your that gram is what we use as a substrate to just replete one gram. How do we do that? Well, what we have in the clinic, we use uh, ferric gluconate, ferlicet. We use 125 milligram daily for eight doses to so week one gram. As an outpatient, the formula we have is iron sucrose, vinofer. We can use up to 300 milligrams every other day for three to four doses. Now, there's new preparation like ferric carboximaltose, which is a great preparation. They have that in Mexico. You can give a gram in a single dose. You give a gram in a single dose. There's no need to do a test dosing. And some hematologists actually give a gram one day and another gram the next day. Just optimize iron. So you, I was trained in my initial residency that iron was horrible, unsafe. It caused anaphylaxis. These people die from it. I, I avoided it at all costs. However, reviewing the data, in a review of 30 million doses, only 11 deaths were reported secondary to iron use, and only 1,000 adverse effects. Sucrose, 0.6 per million, gluconate, 0.9 per million, low molecular dextrin, 3 per million, and high molecular weight dextrin, 11 per million. Nobody uses high molecular weight dextrin anymore in the state. There's people, like Michael Auerbach is one of the biggest uh, guys in anemia, he uses low molecular weight dextrin, but, but, but uh, with a, with, he, he does the test dosing first. This is most recent, a couple of years ago. When you compare the risk of anaphylactic reaction associated with the use of IV iron, actually the safest one is actually iron sucrose, like 20%. It's the, the venofer. Is it the one who has the risk, the less cumula least cumulative risk of anaphylaxis? And some of the newer preparation, like Fremoxto, they did not compare uh, ferric carboximaltose, but it's a little bit kind of, kind of uh, similar to, to iron gluconate. And this is the one we use. We haven't had a single reaction since we implemented the protocol in 2011. So the NAT is a network for advancement of transition alternatives. It's a worldwide organization, and they focus on optimizing pre-op anemia. Found that the use of pre-op iron one gram of pre-op iron decreases blood transition by about two-thirds of the time. Where is indication for IV iron? Ferritin less than 100, saturation less than 20%, or unexpected blood loss more than 1,500 mL. We use the same parameter, but if the expected blood loss is actually more than 500 mL. What has that yielded? Well, one gram of iron roughly increases your hemoglobin about two grams per deciliter. It decreases your transfusion about two-thirds decrease your cost, morbidity, infection rate, and all the um, adverse effects we have, we have said. And also, you bypass the impaired enteral iron bioavailability. So this is our protocol. Hemoglobin less than 13, ferritin less than 100, and TSAT less than 20%. We use one gram of iron. If the ferritin is less than, than 100, but TSAT more than 20, we may use up to 600 milligrams of iron. Your ferritin is less than 500. So remember, for chronic kidney disease, they, they, they still use iron in, I mean, the, the KDGO guidelines. Up, even they even go to a ferritin of 800, but we use 500 as the old KDOKI guidelines. If it's 500 and that is less than 20, we do the same thing and assess retic reticulocytosis. Now, what about EPO? I will really cut to the chase here because we don't use EPO that often. This is more used in the patient with anti-renal disease. But the poetin alpha is used in patients who have hemoglobin of 10 to 13 who are at risk for an elective non-cardiac non-vascular surgery. And the recommendation is to use 40,000 units per week. That's really cold start. We don't even use the, the weight base. It's not indicated and not covered for autologous blood donation based on the studies that said that all blood was bad. CMS just covers for orthopedic surgery for a knee or a hip joint change and for Jehovah's Witnesses exclusively. Also, EPO is linked with increased risk of high blood pressure and increased risk of DVT. So in any patient who had an active malignancy, if, and, and it's not on treatment or has had a VTE, we do not use EPO whatsoever. So the, our protocol is if the patient has an hemoglobin between 10 and 13, and they have normal iron stores, and basically normal ferritin and normal SAT, we use the 40,000 units weekly, 
Often 40,000 a week of EPO ratio your hemoglobin about 0.25 to 0.5. So it's not that much. So you may need to give at least like four, four doses to raise your hemoglobin by two grams. Why do you care about those two grams? Well, because if my hemoglobin is 10 and now it's 12 and I bleed five, instead of going from 10 to five and me, be in the area for transition, it goes from 12 to seven. And it keeps me away the threshold for transition. So far I have shown you, yeah, we can optimize um, iron deficiency, we can optimize visual deficiency, we can work on uh, ensuring that we do an appropriate workup for, for celiac disease, for, for active blood, uh, blood losses. But what about real life? I mean, all this is very theoretical. Can we improve this? Well, blood utilization is a burning platform overall. It was a burning platform in the Cleveland Clinic in 2007. We were the single institution in the United States with the highest blood utilization of years. It was a shame. It was shameful. I mean, no. and, and with all the codes. So we needed to do something. So what is the principle for bloodless medicine? Well, do not get daily labs. If you get labs, use pediatric tubes for med pitch guys. You know that. Prevent blood loss. Opti optimize uh, coagulopathy. Stimulate the hematopoiesis, give iron, give B12, give folate, give zinc, optimize nutrition. Now, which are the patients who may have the highest risk of blood loss and blood utilization among the surgical patients? It's often the patient with hip replacement or the patient with, uh, with a femoral fracture. So we focus on those patients, orthopedic patients, the highest utilizer, and, and even more than the patient with coronary artery bypass grafting. Well, first of all, now we have benchmarking. We compare surgeon versus surgeon, hostel versus hostel, service versus service, and we can see who has the most, the lowest restrictive trigger, who has the highest restrictive trigger, and also we look at the threshold. So benchmarking helps us to see, hey, you are using more blood, and your outcomes are not better than the guy that uses less blood. You need to change your practice. So we're able to talk to the surgeon, I mean, um, we, of course, we have a, a, a iron shield, like, like when we talk to them, make sure they don't hit us back. And, um, and we, just, we, just, just tell, we tell them, hey, you know what? This is this very compelling evidence. You are, your outcomes are not better. You need to change your practice. And they have been really moving into the, and, and buying into this. We have a, a, the formal protocol, as I have said to you. We have a blood management order, so this is an EPIC, when you have a, a blood management uh, console, you order a CBC, iron and ferritin, and for patients more than 60 years old, vitamin B12, we do not routinely check folate because most of the high value care initiatives have demonstrated the folic acid doesn't really change the measuring, it doesn't really change the outcome. And basically the workflow is that when we get this lab and the patient sounds to be anemic, they let the surgeon know and we have the orders for, uh, for using iron and the surgeon signs it and the patient goes to any blood transfusion center to get IV iron. We also change the way we routinely transfuse two units of blood. Why two units? Because we were all trained to give two units. But we change that. Only a single unit. If somebody orders two units, blood bank say, why two units? Give one, we'll save the other for you. It's sure the patient really needs it. One unit at a time. So that has cost, cut the cost by about $250,000 just by using one unit of blood. Just by changing this, from night to day, you cut your transition rate by 50% and to $50,000. So we use pediatric tubes, you decrease one third of phlebotomized blood. We do try not to get daily tests and even Q forty eight hours or we wanted to move to Q forty Q seventy two hours. My resident they get daily coax on everybody. Why do you need a daily coax on everybody? We don't need daily coax. <laughs> and maybe in the liver disease patient get a daily you know, that's fine. But that particular or the IT patient, but that's the only reason. So we can minimize the atrogenic blood loss. We can maintain the blood volume. We can expand the patient volume, expand the preload. In the surgery, the surgeon can use hemostatic agent, tranexamic acid, epsilon amino caproic, use some factor supplementation. Before surgery, we can use iron, we can use EPO, B12. 
For the patient who has coagulopathy from platelet dysfunction or thrombocytopenia, we can use romiplostim, a thrombo pack, IVIG, steroid, improve or fix this, use this EIVP. We can increase oxygen delivery technique. Really, this is more like, is there, the military surgeon use that, we don't really use it at all, and there's no experience with oxygen carrying uh, in the clinic. So there's this trial with an examic gas, and this trial is very nice because it really is also the systematic review and meta-analysis, and they found that in nine trials of up to 700 patients, decreased the blood loss by about 600 ml. So you really decrease substantially the risk of, of transfusing patients when you use an examic acid. So this is what we use. The recommendation that we gave the surgeon was to use epsilon amino caproic. Remember that all the tranexamic acid um, controversy that was in cardiac surgery patient about five, six years ago, say tranexamic acid linked with worse mortality, and then they revisited that, found that lower dose of tranexamic acid is tolerably safe. So we use tranexamic acid in order to patient. So when we compare surgeon with after surgeon, after, before and after, there was a, a decrease in the transition rate of all the surgeons, even with the guy with the low, the guy with the lowest transition actually started transitioning more after we implemented it. But there was the overall orthopedic uh, main campus, there was a, a substantial decrease in the, in the amount of transition. This has been kind of very, very flat. And they're extremely mindful of optimizing um, the hematopoiesis, optimizing hematinics, minimizing blood loss, and optimizing uh, coagulation function. So we need to educate out there, need to understand that blood transition is expensive, cost $1,000. Medicare does not pay you for the first three units that you use. That's why we say we need to, people to donate blood. So when you get that blood, so people donate blood to the bank, because the first three units that you use, you do not get paid. You get paid after the fourth unit. So it's $3,000 you don't get paid. I mean, if you need it, you need it. But the point is, uh, you don't want to give four units. You don't want to start putting the patient at risk of mortal incision. And try to educate out there and share this with, uh, with your students and ensure they are mindful of the thing that can impair iron absorption, B12 absorption, a thing that can cause the patient to have decreased hematopoiesis and, uh, of course, do an appropriate work for anemia and fix that rather than just transfusing liberally. And if you need to transfuse, you need to transfuse but be mindful of the consequences. Thank you.